Generating traffic and sales can be a challenge for online merchants. But selling on the Walmart marketplace puts your products in front of millions of customers who shop on walmart.com. And right now, sellers who join Walmart Marketplace can save up to 50% on referral and fulfillment fees for the first 90 days. So get started today. Head over to marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. That's marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. Welcome to e-commerce conversations, a podcast by practical e-commerce. What is going on, Internet? Eric Van Holtz back again with another e-commerce conversations. I hope all is going well on the other side of the internet. On the other side of the internet from me, Sarah with Curry Bod. Curry Bod, do you go by Curry Bod or is it just curry or it's Curie. Curie. Named after Marie Curie. Marie Curie, the scientist. Yes. Radiation, right? Yeah. So Marie Curie was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize, only person to win a Nobel Prize in two different sciences. And this was all in the 1800s when women weren't even getting an education, let alone winning Nobel Prizes. So she was a trailblazer. She discovered elements that led to radiation therapy, chemotherapy, x-ray machines. She was truly a trailblazer. And I actually, fun story, I did a book report on her in fifth grade, like one of those, you know, fold out visual book reports. And she really stuck with me. And when, when it came time to name my company, I wanted it, you know, I wanted to name the business after someone that really represented who I was building the company for, which was people who are out there building businesses, building lives, raising families, trailblazing. And so I named it uh, Curie after her. Oh, that's a cool story. I didn't know that. Yeah. So the radiation was one thing she won the Nobel Peace Prize for. What was the other one? Um, I actually don't know. That's a, I should probably know that. I've, I've read her biography twice, <laughs> but I don't actually remember exactly what she won her second Nobel Prize for. It's going to kill me because I'm Googling. We can, it. Well, I'll follow up and we can put it in the show notes so people can, <laughs> can read all about her. She's but, Polish too, so I'm yeah. uh, half Polish. So it's uh, always cool to see. Polish people find success. Very cool. Yeah. Her husband was French and I'm French. So we got some some ancestry representation there. So I'm excited to bring you on the show because what people don't know is we had a phone call probably about a year ago where you hopped on and asked me for advice on going on Shark Tank. Yes. And thank you so much for that, by the way, because I cold reached out to you, I think on Twitter DMs and was just like, Hey, you were on Shark Tank. Like, can we talk? And I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to a stranger. Yeah. Well, I don't know if my advice was any good or not, but why don't you go ahead and give our listeners, you ended up being on Shark Tank just like last week. Yes. Yes. So we ended up airing on Shark Tank last week. Friday. So a little over a week ago, it was a very long process. As you know, we applied to be on the show. I actually applied to be on the show in 2020, didn't get on, reapplied in 2021, actually had a conversation with Patrick from Supply in like February of 2021. And he was like, you should go on Shark Tank. It was huge for us. And I told him like, oh, I applied last year. I didn't get on the show, but maybe I'll, yeah, maybe I'll apply again. And got off the phone with him, applied on the Shark Tank website, and ended up getting on the show second time around. So we filmed, I filmed the show in September. And then as you know, once you film, you kind of just wait around until they tell you it's going to air. They give you three weeks notice. So we definitely prepared for it. You know, we bought tons of inventory. We were ready to go with a website update, website revamp and just kind of had to wait until we got the call. And so we got the call and we ended up airing March 11th. That is uh, just, I remember those days, like, is this your first business? Yeah. Okay. So like everything is like completely new for the first time. It's just, I, I don't think there's like a better feeling in life than experiencing such a major win of having like a seven minute commercial on national TV. Yes. Do you feel that same kind of high like during the whole process or like describe what goes through your... I feel so lucky. I mean, this is my first business. I didn't know anything about 
e-commerce prior to starting Curie. So my background, I was a CPA, certified public accountant out of college, did that for two years, hated it, but got a really good foundation in finance and accounting and, you know, really understanding having a solid foundation in accounting, I think is really important as a founder. And so did that for two years, worked in venture capital for four and a half years. So I was an associate at an early stage venture capital fund. We started to dabble a little bit in direct to consumer. And that became kind of my sweet spot. I've always loved brands and always been passionate about brands and products. And because I was one of the only female investors in LA, a lot of the clean beauty companies that were popping up left and right in 2016, 2017 were coming and pitching me. And so that's really how I got interested in this space. Had the idea for Curie, started as a personal need, couldn't find an aluminum free deodorant that worked for me. So I made my own. Um, I didn't actually make it myself. <laughs> I hired a chemist. I knew that if we were going to make something that worked, it wasn't going to be me making it in my kitchen. So I hired a chemist, a formulator that helped us create our aluminum free deodorant. And it really just took off from there. And I have learned, and I think a lot of people listening can probably relate to this, is like, I had no idea what I was doing. I have learned everything along the way. The last two and a half years have basically been a free MBA where I've just learned everything from Googling, from talking to other founders and just getting lucky and, you know, setting ourselves up for success and waiting for those opportunities to come. And Shark Tank is a really good example of like, I really wanted to be on Shark Tank. I knew from the very beginning We got that no. I applied in 2020. We didn't get on the show, but I really think timing is everything. The timing wasn't right in 2020. The timing was right in 2021, and we got on the show. And the response has been so unbelievable since the show aired. If anyone hasn't seen it, here's a spoiler. We ended up getting a deal with Mark Cuban and Barbara Corcoran. And the response to the show has just been beyond my wildest dreams. I thought we had more than enough inventory and we are completely cleaned out, completely sold out of our products right now. Yeah, that's a, so, I mean, I don't know like how much you want to divulge in like the amount of growth or the amount of volume. You know, I was on Shark Tank 2014, so it's coming up on nearly a decade. Like, you know, is the show still relevant? Clearly, you know, it's still yes. making an impact and you know, like talk about your strategy. You mentioned you rebuilt your website or you redesigned it. Mm -hmm. Walk me through everything that you're doing in preparation for the show. Obviously you scaled up inventory, things like that, but. Yeah. So in terms of volume, we did double what we did our entire first year of business in revenue in six hours after Shark Tank aired. The response has been unbelievable. We sold out that night on the Friday night that it aired. And we have, I think, going on 5,000 person wait list right now for our deodorant. So it's been unbelievable. And in terms of getting ready for Shark Tank, I put so much work into, and you know this, like from when we had that conversation, I did so much work to prepare for Shark Tank. Like with this opportunity and really any opportunity I've had, whether it's been QVC, whether it's been expanding into retail, whether it's been Shark Tank. If I get these opportunities, like I will never let myself be the reason that it's not successful. Like I make sure I put a hundred percent, like every possible thing I can do to prepare to make this a success. And that was really how I thought about Shark Tank. I joke that like I prepared for Shark Tank, like I was an athlete going to the Olympics. I talked to everyone I possibly could find that had been on the show, including yourself. I, again, redid our website. We had our old website was just a pretty basic Shopify theme that I had created myself years ago. And it really wasn't optimized for, you know, AOV. We didn't have any upsell. Our homepage wasn't shoppable. There was way too many clicks to get to checkout. So that was my first thing is like, let's make sure when we have all this traffic, we have a website that's optimized for conversion. So we ended up publishing our new site five days before Shark Tank aired, which I definitely don't recommend. (laughs) If you have a big surge in traffic coming up, like I definitely recommend giving yourself a little bit more buffer than that. But 
okay, that's how it worked out for us. And at least our site didn't crash. There were definitely still some bugs here and there that we were fixing day of. But even afterwards, you know, things, issues that we had spotted. And I wish that we had done that site update a little sooner. But that was the big thing we did to prepare as well as just ramping up on inventory. We're fortunate in that QVC is a big volume driver for us. So we were able to ramp up inventory in preparation for Shark Tank without the big risk of, you know, maybe Shark Tank not airing and then being stuck with, you know, all this inventory. We were lucky in that we always have QVC and we could always offload some of that inventory onto QVC. So ramping up inventory was not an issue for us. Again, I thought we had more than enough, but the Shark Tank effect was real and was much bigger than I had imagined. Yeah. And I guess of all the problems to have, that's the best one, selling out of product. Yes and no. I mean, any e-commerce entrepreneur listening can relate to like, when you sell out, people are like, yeah, congratulations. That's amazing. As a founder, like behind the scenes, you're like, oh no, oh no, we're sold out. Like, what are we going to do about all of our subscribers? Like, about, you know, retailers, you know, all of our retailers sold out and now they want back in and we can't send them products. Like with selling out comes a lot of problems and people sometimes get mad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if when you've been sold out, like you get those emails. But again, I, I'm going to tell you, you know, like your operations person quitting on you yeah. or running out of cash, you know, like these are not fun problems. Yes. There's bigger problems. Yes, I know. There's bigger problems. But behind the scenes, anytime you're sold out, it's a scramble just trying to get back in. Yeah. And especially with supply chain slowdowns right now, we're just hustling to get back in stock so we can still you know, capture some of that demand from Shark Tank. How long do you think you're going to be out of stock? Our production just got moved up, which I'm really grateful for. So we're going to be running our deodorant stick and spray the first and second week of April. So we'll be back in stock soon. Okay. One thing I love about your website is you're using this font, Kaftan. Yes, that's new. Yeah, I haven't seen any other websites use this. And it's such a distinctive font. You know, like I assume there is some debate on whether or not to go with something so bold or... Yeah, we went back and forth on this one because... I really love this font. It really, I think also our kind of motto or slogan is like for humans in motion. We wanted, and I think with our, we had traditionally just used brand and grotesque, which is a very like structured font, whereas the caftan font has a lot more movement to it. And so we went back and forth on this font. We're like, is it too girly? Because we do have a lot of male customers, especially because our spray deodorant is in locker rooms nationwide, hundreds of studios, all soul cycles and hundreds of other studios in the men's and women's locker rooms. So we do have a growing customer base of men. And so we went back and forth. Is this, is this too girly? Is this too feminine? And ultimately we decided, Hey, the people that are buying our products, the men that are buying our products are not going to be turned off by a font that might look a little bit girly. Yeah. And I mean, like you're not using it on the packaging either. I don't know if you have like future packaging evolution to include this font or not, but. Yeah, it's, it is a very unique font and I love how it looks on the site. I love how the site turned out. Yeah. Was that done in-house or you worked with an agency for this or? We did it. We have a graphic designer who's done all of our packaging and design since the very beginning. So she did all the design and then we ended up buying just an archetype, archetype theme called streamline and just making customizations to that theme. And so we just had a hourly Shopify developer that made the updates and then our designer drove all the, you know, design. So we didn't hire an agency and probably saved ourselves a lot of money <laughs> by doing that. Yeah, I mean like a ground up design is, you know, like twenty, thirty thousand dollars nowadays. Oh, we were getting like $50,000 quote. Oh, is it that much now? Yeah, it was pricey. And I asked around a lot, went to people's websites and asked, you know, how they had made them. And I had a couple founders that recommended archetype, I don't know how to say it, archetype, archetype mm-hmm. themes. And so we played around with Streamline. I downloaded it one afternoon 
and started to build the site using that streamlined theme and was able to get like 80% there just myself. And then our designer made some, you know, slight tweaks, slight like aesthetic customizations. We ended up adding in some new apps, you know, like our upsell app on the cart and all in all, it ended up costing us probably one tenth of what it would cost if we had gone with an agency. Yeah. We used an archetype theme as well. Uh, was it prestige? I believe. Mm-hmm. Yep. But you know, one of our goals in 2023 is we're relaunching our website again mm-hmm. and we're actually switching to a crown theme developer. So, Oh, what's that? Well, it's the name of their company. So oh, okay. But it's the same thing, you know, like buying something out of the box, you get 90% of the way there, 95% of the way there. And in my opinion, you know, unless you have very specific needs for your store, which most e-commerce people at this point probably don't, you know, development is going to be pretty good to just do it yourself. Yeah. And like what we liked about Archetype was that they've done all the research already. Like everything is really, really optimized on all of their themes and the streamlined theme we chose that one because that's their most mobile optimized one and since so much of our traffic is mobile we're like let's just go with this one and i think i just figured why reinvent the wheel and especially at the stage that we're at maybe one day we'll go build up like a ground up custom theme but for what we needed and the speed that we needed it we were able to get this live pretty quickly and i think it looks pretty great and it's performing really well our average order value is actually up like i think last time we checked it's up 23 percent since we launched this new theme nice did you do any kind of like email collection strategies for the shark tank is that still going on or did it you just do it for the show and, and what was that like yeah that was a big priority obviously converting customers was the number one priority but we also wanted to capture as many emails as possible So we had a email capture pop-up that we made special for a special like Shark Tank flow for just the weekend. So Friday through Sunday, we ran a 15% off site-wide sale and had that site-wide sale be promoted through the email capture pop-up. And we ended up, that was super successful. We got a ton of email signups and also a ton of purchases. So win-win. Yeah. You know, I wish I was like you. I am the complete opposite. I'm more of like go with the flow and if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, it doesn't kind of deal. And, you know, I subsequently, I didn't prepare the same way that you prepared. I was just like. I prepared like crazy. Like I just, again, like I had this opportunity and I wasn't going to waste it. And I put so much work into it. In hindsight, like there's things that I probably, you know, wasted my time on especially with like the preparation for the show actually but no i i take that back i put so many hours in preparing for shark tank and i'm so happy with how the episode turned out i don't think any of it was wasted if you watch the show if you watch the episode like i came off as very prepared and very confident and i don't think the show would have gone as well the episode wouldn't have gone as well if i hadn't prepared as much as i had i watched tons of episodes like i watched so much shark tank i made pages and pages and pages of potential questions i practiced i practiced my pitch again and again and again i put a lot of work into preparing and i think it showed in the episode i think you know what's interesting about shark tank and some people may not know this or not is probably about 80 percent get on the show so there's like a 20 percent shot Mm -hmm. that you're not going to to make the cut and sometimes it can be You know, just like there's a war going on and we're sorry to interrupt, but, you know, here's whatever state of the union. I don't know if you heard that I actually was not only like, can you film and you only have an 80 percent of airing after you film, but I was also a standby company. So I wasn't even like guaranteed to film, period. Mm. So I had to do all this work in preparation and I didn't even know if I was going to film And then after I filmed, still wasn't even sure if I was going to air. Yeah. I mean, for my experience, you're out in LA, Culver City. And, you know, for me, I was like the last to go or the second to last to go on like the last day of filming. And and like, sometimes they'll just send you back home. You know, you go out there and. Yeah, I've heard that. 
And I've had uh, friends who film it as well, and they never got on air. So it's mm -hmm. it's a ringer, and, and there's a risk in you know like spending a lot of time preparing for the show and, and never getting it on. I think obviously, I think you need to build a special company to get onto Shark Tank. And I'm just curious as to all the things that you've done to build the business. I've had you're the third deodorant company on my podcast. I've had Jamie Schmidt and, had Moise. and Moise, Moise as well. So it's clearly a very competitive marketplace and we sell deodorant not very well, not very successfully. <laughs> so I'm doing something wrong, but maybe I can learn <laughs> from you. Like, how do you find success in the deodorant market? Yeah. I mean, good question. It is a competitive space. It's something I talked about on Shark Tank, but uh, so kind of going back to the origins of the company, we launched with one product, one SKU, it was our aluminum-free stick deodorant. I launched Curie on $12,000 in my savings, had zero marketing budget, really just bootstrap side hustle for that first year and was able to scale up into six figures of revenue in that first year just based on organic customer acquisition, word of mouth, some influencers posting, you know, press. And I think it's just a testament to the brand. I built the brand in a way that I think that really resonated to a specific group of customers that weren't having their needs met. I think second, a lot of people still felt like aluminum free deodorant wasn't for them. It didn't work for them. I think myself being an athlete, a marathon runner, being really, really present on our social media and all of our emails, like in the early days. In that first year, Curie was Sarah and Sarah was Curie. Our customers were buying the product because they were seeing my face on Instagram. I was going on 15 mile training runs and sniffing my armpits at the end and being like, I still smell like white tea. Um, and so I think that the way that we built the brand so organically during that first year, we got those, whatever that phrase, you know, thousand raving customers. And that really created this kind of launch pad for us where after that first year, I was like, where can we take this? Because at that point, deodorant was becoming more and more competitive. There's been 10 new deodorant companies that have popped up every month over the last two years. So deodorant was becoming more and more competitive. And so I had these customers that were really, really bought in, loved the brand. Our repeat purchase rate was really high. So I started to think about where can we take this that is, you know, we can continue the growth and continue the, the momentum and not be solely focused on deodorant. And so starting to talk to our customers, we realized our customers loved our signature scents. We have our three signature scents. They're proprietary scents. We developed them with a, a scent house that we still work with. and our customers wanted to use the deodorant on their whole body. They love the scents that much. If you're an orange Neroli girl, you wanted orange Neroli everywhere. If you're a white tea guy, you wanted to be use it, you know, not just on your underarms. And so we started to think long-term about the business as kind of a bath and body works, but clean and for next generation. And that's really where we've gone in the last two years in terms of product development. We launched our full body deodorant spray, our whipped body wash, a body oil. We have candles. We're about to launch a collaboration with a big scent diffuser company. And we're really positioning ourselves to be that clean scent company that makes you know clean personal care products and beyond that, including eventually home fragrance, anywhere that you want to smell good. And so we've seen the response from our customers they're not just buying deodorant. I don't think our customers think of us as just a deodorant company anymore. And I think that'll continue as we evolve the business into more of a, a lifestyle brand focused on clean signature scents. Yeah, I think, you know, the challenge of building a business like that, of course, is first of all, getting boxed in to uh, a certain type of product. As you can imagine, mm -hmm. we go through a beard brand and then... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the other challenge it's is hard to break out of that, that everyone wants to put you in a box. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it makes sense, you know, like you want to have your deodorant company and your shampoo company and this and that, but how do you, you know, as a bootstrap company, having three fragrances, you know, really can become a challenge, you know, hitting or, or having MOQs and being able to order enough. Do you take a strategy of launching a product with just one fragrance and then bring in three more in, or, you know, it's, tell me how you work through that. That's a great question that not a lot of people think about because everyone's like, you guys should come out with this fragrance. Why don't you come out with a coconut? Why don't you do this and that? And I'm like, we have 
six products now. We don't just have the deodorant. So every time we launch a new fragrance or launch a new scent, we have to think about, you know, putting it, incorporating it into our stick deodorant, spray deodorant, hand sanitizer, body wash. And so how we're thinking, and we actually just brought on Anne Gottlieb. She is the nose of CPG. If you Google search her, there's this amazing Wall Street Journal article on her. She was the woman that developed all of Bath, Bath and Body Works original signature scents. She's also worked with Chanel high-end fragrance to Axe body spray. She's been the nose of CPG for like the past 35 years. She's a legend. She's like just lives this like fabulous life on the Upper West Side in New York. And I love her. And so she um she joined as an investor and an advisor and she's developing our next, you know, dozen signature scents. And so dozen. I've been working with her thinking, I mean, she's gonna be with us forever. I'm just thinking okay. into the future. <laughs> um she is we're not we're not anytime soon, but we're our plan is to launch one to two new signature scents a year. And so talking with her and brainstorming with her, how we can do that in a way that works with our, you know, with a bootstrap budget, our plan, and we're launching a new scent in May. And our plan is to drop the new scents in just one SKU and use that as kind of a test. So we're launching a new scent in May. That's a collaboration with a big fitness studio. And that's going to be only available in our spray deodorant until we, you know, test the market and figure out if we want to expand that into the other products as well. And then the nice thing about that is by the time we do expand it into our other products, there's already that loyalty, hopefully to that scent from the people who have bought it in the spray deodorant, and it'll make it a little bit easier to, to expand versus just going all in immediately. So I think that's the plan to, for, for launching the new scents is like focus each of the new scents on one product and kind of treat that one product as a proof of concept. And then we can expand into the rest of the product line if it's successful. Will you kill a fragrance to have it replaced? Yes, we will definitely kill a fragrance if it's not performing. And we also will potentially be killing products as well. I think that's something I've had to think about over the last six months, especially because just as an example, we launched our hand sanitizer during 2020, it was wildly successful. Um, that really saved our business actually in 2020. At the time, we were only coming into COVID, we were we only had deodorant. And deodorant sales when COVID started fell off a cliff. People were quarantined at home. They weren't wearing deodorant, I guess. I was, but I guess a lot of people stopped wearing deodorant when they weren't going into the office or going out in public as much. And so our deodorant sales, we saw an immediate impact when COVID started. And so we launched the hand sanitizer. Like I spent count, like hours and hours, three in the morning, calling factories in China, trying to get bottles so we could create and make our hand sanitizer. And we were able to hustle and get that product launched in May of 2020. And it really saved the business in 2020. And now we look at hand sanitizer and it's less than 5% of our, of our business. Yeah. And so now I'm kind of going through that exercise of looking at our SKUs and thinking, where can we cut and focus on what's working? And I think the hand sanitizer is a good example of that, of, of a product that we might end up discontinuing. Yeah. I mean, I think the challenge is always going to be you develop great fragrances that people love and you know, as you add new fragrances, my unsolicited feedback would be to kill one, mm -hmm. but you're in, in doing so you're going to, you know, you're always going to have people who are like, this was my fragrance. Always going to have angry people. Yeah. You know, so like the sooner you can make that part of your culture, probably the, the better because, yeah, you know, uh, people get attached. We're killing three of our fragrances this year. So really? Yeah. How did you make that decision? I mean, it was a decision that was made, you know, three years ago. But mm -hmm. for us, one of our core reminders is this word focus, which as an ADD entrepreneur, I, I don't have. Yeah. It's really fun to chase shiny things. And then you realize. Yeah. Yeah. You, well, you see the opportunity everywhere. Like you can't not see the opportunity yeah. as an entrepreneur. But then when you actually execute on it, you, you run into these issues. Yeah. And I think it's it's just like 
you know, if you have one product like a deodorant and one fragrance, your MOQ could be like 5,000 units. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can move through mm -hmm. that 5,000 units just fine, like once every month or once every couple months. But if you have six of them, now you have to order 30,000 mm -hmm. units. And then like if you buy 30,000, then it's going to take you six months to go exactly. through it or, or however many, 12 months. So like that's always the balance that you have to juggle. And we just feel like we're going to be in a better position of fewer fragrance options. And it, but it's, it's challenging because we didn't have any dogs. Yeah. You know, it's not yeah. like there was any easy decision on which ones to kill. I know. And so how many do you guys have now? And how many cents will you have after you cut those three? Yeah. So we'll have, you know, we have six on the website okay. right now at beardbrand.com. And then we've got, you know, three through Target. Mm -hmm. And then we're cutting three on the website. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to get rid of a lot of decision yeah. fatigue that can happen between like, we have two lines, like a silver line and a gold line. Mm -hmm. But there's also the advantage of, you know, kind of like price positioning mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, setting those examples. So everything's a give and take in business and there's no right or wrong. You just kind of got to do mm -hmm. it and go with your gut mm -hmm. as a smaller company, I think. But enough about me. I mean, this isn't. The... I know. Now I'm interviewing you. <laughs> yeah. No, but that's really interesting. I think that's something people don't. People don't think about with with launching new scents is it's exciting and our customers get excited and you know QVC is it always loves a new scent launch, but mm -hmm. we have to think about you know we don't have one SKU anymore we have multiple SKUs and how can we I guess dabble in new scents without having to make that thirty thousand unit MOQ commitment and even just beyond the MOQ commitment the process of incorporating a scent into all these different products and going through the stability testing and getting all the packaging and all of that. It's a huge undertaking. So I think that's our short-term solution for being able to dabble in new scents and test different scents without having to make that huge commitment is to make them like scent exclusives for specific products and we'll see how that goes. I'll let you know. Yeah. Yeah. And for those who don't know. Maybe people will <laughs> complain because they're like, I want this new scent and everything. Why don't you have it? But I think it, it's a good like short-term solution for us to be able to still test new things and without having to go all in. Yeah. Fragrance is probably one of the most difficult things in our industry because, you know, one fragrance may work in a water-based product, but it won't work in an oil base. Mm -hmm. One fragrance. Yep may work well with the base ingredients and kind of just smell perfectly and one may be completely blown out by the exactly it's especially challenging when you're working with natural ingredients too right. because you know we try one scent in our spray deodorant and it smells amazing and then we incorporate it into our stick deodorant which is coconut oil based and coconut oil has a natural smell to it and the scent is completely different. Maybe it's, it's usually too sweet or something in our stick deodorant and it's perfect in the spray. And we have to make tweaks. It's a lot more complicated, I think, than I had realized. <laughs> Welcome, <laughs> to the party. Welcome to the party. Where, where can people support you? Where can they follow you? Where can they find yeah, you? Yeah, they can find us at curiebod.com. We are sold out right now, but you can join our wait list and we'll be launching pre-order in the next week or two, probably two weeks. And you're on Twitter too. Yes. Right? And then you can find, you know, Curie on Instagram, Twitter, all the platforms at Curie Bod. Check out our TikTok. And you can find me on Twitter at That's Amore. I do a lot of tweeting. There you go. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I enjoyed hearing your success. It's always fun to find an entrepreneur in a time where things are going bonkers. Yeah, so thank you. Thanks, thanks for, for having me. In. I've been such a yeah. fan of this podcast. Like it's, I'm so excited to be a guest on it. I've been listening for a long time. Well, you mentioned Patrick. I recorded an episode with him before this. So uh, you will be following him in the series. Nice. I love your guys' the podcasts you do together are great. Sweet. All right, guys, this has been another e-commerce conversations. Hope you enjoyed this and Learned as many things that I learned. As always, thanks for listening. Cheers. And keep on growing. Okay.